Okay, let me share my screen. There we go. Okay, so we are going to cover how to sketch graphs. Um, for the most part, you just create a table, plug in random x values, and then hopefully everything maps out and you can draw the graph. We will also talk about some specific information on graphs like x and y intercepts. We'll also talk about symmetry um, and how you can use symmetry to sketch a graph. And then we can write equations and sketch graphs of circles. That's the big one. This is what the test is going to be over. Um, and then use graphs of equations solving real uh, life applications. And we might not necessarily get into that. I don't think I saw any word problems in this section, but I could be wrong. Um, but we're going to jump right. In. So the first bit of information, and this is in your packet. If you have it with you, you can um, use it. If not, if it's an online student, they don't have the packet, so they have to write this down. Um, but here it's going to start explaining the graph of an equation. So we have already used the coordinate system to draw um, points, right? And we've even um, learned the distance formula on how to figure out the length between two points. But you can also use graphs to represent a relationship between not two points, but two quantities. So um, something like, let me see, try to think. Like if you purchase a calculator, each calculator costs $20, right? But if you purchase 15 of them, then you would have to multiply that value by 15, right? And so you're taking one quantity, which is the number of calculators you're about to purchase, you're multiplying it by that $5 price, and what you end up with is a price, right? A dollar amount. So your input, one quantity, would be the number of calculators, and the other quantity would be the dollar amount at the end, okay? So it's two totally different kinds of quantities. Now, sometimes you might have special relationships where the input might be also a dollar value, and the output is also a dollar value. But in my case of the calculators, the input is actually the number of calculators, and then the output would be the total cost. Okay. But it is any kind of two quantity. They could be similar in units, or they could have no units in common whatsoever, like calculators and dollars, right? They're not the same thing. <laughs> okay. Um, the graphical picture consisted of a collection of points in a coordinate system is what the graph, that's the graph. Okay. So essentially, if I get a whole bunch of x coordinates, I use an equation to find all of the y values. If I plot all of those points, it should create a graphical image, okay? That's all that that's saying. Um, and so then most of the times we will use equations in two variables. You've seen them, they look kind of like this, right? Where you have y on one side and then you could have a single x or you could have multiple x's on the other side. But that equation is what's establishing that relationship, okay? So it's telling you how x is related to y, okay? In this instance, if I multiply x by negative three and then I add a seven, I will get the value for y. And so that's how x is related to y in this particular equation. Now, for each x I plug in here, I will be able to calculate a y value. And so when you do that, you create um, points, so an X coordinate and then a Y coordinate. And it says an ordered pair, and it uses random letters, A and B, is a solution or a solution point of an equation. Meaning that if I plug in the Y value here, B, there, and I plug in this X value, A, for X, this left-hand side should equal this right-hand side. And that's what they mean by it's a solution. So for instance, in this particular problem, if I were to say that point there is one for a solution to that equation, I don't know. I would have to plug in four for the Y and then one for the X, and then I'd have to compute. And so when I do that multiplication, I get three. And then when I do the subtraction, I get four. And they are equivalent, right? So then this guy is a solution point. However, it could happen as if I have this. Okay. And so then when I go to check that, I have five for Y, 
And this time I have two for X. And when I follow my order of operations, this time I get seven minus six, but that means on the right hand side, I get one. Is five equal to one? No. And so the fact that that one is false, we would say this one is not a solution. And you can say solution or you can say solution point. Either way, it's the same, the same thing, okay? So I think in the homework, it always asks you, is one four a solution to this equation? That's the way they'll phrase it in the homework. Is one four a solution to this equation? And you just plug in the Y, plug in the X, do your computations, and then if they're equal, you say yes. If they're not equal, you say no. Okay, not too bad. Um, oh, how funny, they took this exact same thing. Maybe I saw it subconsciously. <laughs> um, but they did the exact same thing. So notice that it's true. And so that way you say that that one is going to be a solution point. Not only that, if you do find out that a point is a solution point, what that means is that that point is a point on the graph, okay? So this point would not be on the graph. If I saw the image, and this is cool thing, I don't know, like that, here's two five, and that's not a point on the graph. But if you did one four, that might be a point on the graph, okay? That's what I mean by that, okay? So this one is a solution point, meaning it lands on the graph. And then two five is not a solution point, which means that point two five will not land on the graph. Okay. Now, how do we do this, right? So the basic method or technique is to essentially get one of the variables by itself. That's what it means by isolate one of the variables. Now, particularly for us and in the future, you're always gonna wanna isolate the Y value, okay? It may be that it might be easier to isolate the X value like maybe or later in the future. But for right now, you have to solve for Y. That's the guy you're supposed to isolate, okay? And most of the times it's already isolated and it's already given to you as Y equals, okay? So most of the time this step is already done for us, but every now and then we might have to. If they give me a problem like this, Right? If they give me a problem like that, that I have to do step one because X is not all by itself on one side and Y is not all by itself on one side, right? And how would I do that? You would just solve like you normally do. Try to isolate Y means get this whole term that has Y in it by itself first. So that means I have to take this two X and move it over. Well, it's a positive two X. The only way I can move over an entire term the coefficient and the letter. The only way to move over that whole thing is to use add or subtract. Which one would I do to get rid of two X here? Right, because it's positive, right? So you do the opposite, which would be minus or negative. Then I get, and I usually like the X's in the front and the six in the back, but there's nothing wrong with having the six in the front and the minus two X in the back. Those are, equivalent statements there, okay? Both of the two X's are negative, both of the sixes are positive in each of these equations, right? So it doesn't matter which way you write it, this one is leading me toward what's called the standard form, okay? So there is a standard way they like to write them, but we're not there yet. The last thing I need to do is get rid of the coefficient. How do you move over something when you're just trying to move over the coefficient? divide. So when we divide, we need to divide by what? Right, because you want to cancel the three and the negative, right? So we're going to divide everybody by negative three. And when we do that, a negative and a negative will become a positive two thirds. They like to write the X on the side. And then positive six divided by negative three is a negative two. Okay. And then this one is the one we usually like to write depending on what classes you've had before this one, I'm assuming that everyone in here knows how to graph linear or graph lines. Um, that would have been taught in either the 410 class or if you took a 320 class before you took this elementary algebra or intermediate algebra. 
Um, but we're going to cover how to draw them too as well. This is called the slope intercept form. I can't spell the whole word. Intercept. I ran out of space. But that's all one word intercept. Okay. And basically, it tells me the slope, which is the coefficient of x, and it tells me the y intercept. So I should be able to graph this just with this information, but that's not how they suggest we do it. They say once you get the variable by itself, they say to construct a table of values showing several solution points. Now you can find solution points by picking one value for a variable, plugging it in, and then solving for the other variable. And since you have it set up this way, it's best when you do step two that you just start doing random points for X. Because then all you have to do is plug in those random values for X and then do your computations to figure out what Y is gonna be, okay? And as long as you have a variable already isolated, that step becomes a lot easier. Once you're done with that table and you fill it all out, then you plot all the points in the coordinate system, and then you just connect them all. Okay. Now it could make a straight line, it could make a curve, it could do all kinds of things, right? We don't know what the graph's gonna look like until we see all those little points on the graph, okay? And then the last thing says is it's important to use negative values, zero and positive values when um, for the X values when constructing your table, which is exactly what I did naturally in the next, right? You always want to put zero in the center and pick a couple of values on the left of zero on the number line and a couple of values to the right of zero on the number line. That way in the graph, you get, you know, at least something over here on this side and something over there on that side, some sort of image, okay? As you start plugging in values, you may start noticing like, oh, these are giving me high, high Y values that are going to be off the chart. So I can't graph those if they're off the chart. So instead of plugging in these positive X values, which are skyrocketing in my Y values, let me go try to plug in some negative X values and see if I get some more points on my graph, okay? And so you really have to play with that table to make sure that you get a good image on your graph, okay? And you'll see, because we're gonna do a few examples. So the first example is sketching Y equal to negative three X plus seven. And so they say, because the solution is, the equation is already solved for Y, you can just jump straight into constructing a table. Now, what do they do here? Oh, see, I wouldn't have done that at all, but that's what they did. They said, for instance, let's let X equal negative one. When you plug in negative one into that equation that you were given, after you do your computations, which would be a positive three plus seven, you're going to end up with the value 10, which means in the chart, you're gonna have negative one for the X value and you're gonna have 10 for the Y value. And we already know that our points look like this, right? So of course that makes the point negative one, 10. And then you would graph that wherever that is. But you can't graph it with just one point. So you pick a bunch of X values. I usually like to stay even. I like to pick the same number of negatives as I do positives. So typically this is not my default table, okay? My default table would have been what I had in the previous page, which is negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And then that way I could get an idea of what the graph was gonna look like. And so if you plugged in negative one, they already did that, they got 10, right? If you were to plug in zero, they don't show you all the computation, but I'm gonna show it to you, okay? So if I took that equation and I plugged in zero, what is negative three times zero? Zero. And so then you end up with zero plus seven, which is just seven, right? So that's where this number came from. And then I'm gonna also do negative two. So I'm gonna take negative three times negative two plus seven. That's now gonna give me a positive six. 
And then in the end, I end up with 13, which was not one that they had on the list, right? They didn't go into the negatives very far. Now we could do this one. I'm just gonna talk it out. So if I do negative three times one, what do you get? It just stays negative three, right? And then when you add seven, that's why they have this positive four here. Similarly, when you plug in two, negative three times two is gonna be a negative six, but when you add the seven, that's where the one came from. Okay. Oh, I see why they were doing more over there. So this is my default table. And I told you, you usually wanna start off with this, but then you may notice after graphing all of these, that you need to keep going. It may be the case. This one's not really, and I'll explain why. So if I were to plot this, and I know they have it down here, but I'm gonna draw it anyway. So you have negative two and then positive two, right? It says negative two and 13, which means I would have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and it'd be over here. What happens if inside my web assign, what happens if in my web assign, it's only a 10 by 10 box, right? This is obviously scale, but you can get the idea. What if it only, the graph only has from 10 to 10 to 10 in every direction, right? This is gonna be off the graph, isn't it? So that won't be enough for me to graph this. Now let's look at the other one, negative one and 10, it would be right at the very, very edge, but I need some more information. Zero and seven, and then one and four, and then two and one. Now, even though this one would have been off the graph, that pretty much is enough to see what's going on there, right? It just looks like a line, which makes sense because if there's no powers on X, it's called a linear equation, right? If there's no exponents on X, no radicals, X is not in the denominator, it's just one single regular X, then these are called linear equations because they graph lines, okay? So you would just connect your little dots and then you would have that image, okay? Now they use different tables, a different table than I did, but their line is exactly the same. Now, if I had spaced out my numbers exactly the way that they spaced it out, my line would look exactly like there's this, but I didn't space mine out like that, okay? So theirs looks like a little bit slightly different, but it's for the most part, the same thing, okay? It does have the same, what you call slope. So if I go down um, three units and over one, I run into another point on the line. Same thing here, if you go down two, three units and then over one, you get to the next point on the line, okay? So they both do still have the same image, even though they look slightly different, but that's because of the spacing that I put on my graph, okay? I'm not perfect, I'm gonna draw perfect little graphs like that. So they're gonna be off a little bit. Okay. So that's great. You know, I can make this table, I can come up with these values, but in word problems, in applications, and even in just graphing, there are two important bits of information, and those are called the x-intercept and then the y-intercept, okay? And the x-intercept actually happens when um, the y-coordinate is zero. So we'll always have some kind of x-coordinate, but the y-coordinate will always be zero. That's how you land on that x-axis, is if the y value is zero. And for the y-intercept, it's the opposite. The x value is zero, and then the y value is whatever it is, wherever you landed on that y-intercept. Which makes sense, because remember, this is your coordinate system, right? Doesn't matter what point I am here on the X axis, what are the Y coordinates of every single one of those purple points? What is the Y value for all of those purple points? 
is zero because it's on there, right? Right in the middle on the x-axis. And then what about these pink points? If those were my y-intercepts, those are all in the center of the x number line, right? So those would all have x coordinates of zero. So that's where this comes from. It comes from the image, okay? This is interesting to note because if I know this, then that helps me to find the x and y intercepts. Because just like how I can plug in an x value and find a y value, I could very much do the same thing and plug in a y value and find the x value. It might look a little funny. It's not gonna look like the other ones, but it's still possible to do. If you took that equation that we had just worked on, this one there, if you plugged in zero here, which we did, and we got seven, I now know, I now know that zero for X and seven for Y is going to be my Y intercept because it has a value for the Y and not for the X. So when I graph that, it's gonna be on the Y axis. It's gonna be up high, right, at seven. Now the other one is the X intercept. And for lines, it's not so hard to find. But when you start getting into like squares and cubes and quadruples and things like that, then those values are not as easy to find. We're not there yet. It's going to be a few weeks before we get there, <laughs> but we will get there. Okay. And so you will know how to solve the crazy stuff, all the crazy x intercepts. Okay. But for now, we're just doing lines starting at the beginning, and those are still possible to do. So, but for x intercepts, I would have to plug in zero for the y value. And so you actually end up with an equation like this, right? I took the main equation that they gave us and I plugged in zero for y. And then I can take that equation and just solve for the x value. That's different than this one because this one, the y was by itself. So all I had to do was compute, right? And we got the value. This one doesn't have x by itself. So you can't just compute, you have to solve. Okay, which means I got to move the seven over. So I'm going to minus seven. And then that's gone now, but I still have the negative three X and then divide by that coefficient. And we get positive seven thirds equal to X. That is about what, 2.3 repeating. Okay, I'm going to go to the graph that they drew on the other side. And let's go see if there's an X intercept at about two and a third. Okay, so I'm gonna turn around real quick. So here's two, does that look? Remember, this is three right here in the middle. So it looks about two and a third, right? If I zoom in closer. Does that look like the x-intercept is about two and a third? It does, right? Okay, so it does, I mean, it even gives me fractions, which I don't normally graph, right? <laughs> but if you wanted to know that exact spot, that's how you would calculate it, okay? You plug in zero for the y value and you solve it for x. And then it tells you that exact spot where it's at. Okay, and that's pretty much all we're gonna be doing when it comes to um, the intercepts. You plug in zero for one, you plug in zero for the other. Once you have those two values, it's just a matter of you putting the right one in the right spot. If it's asking for the x-intercept, then you put in where you got x equals to whatever you got. Okay. If it asks you for y intercepts, then you put the y value, the one that has the value for the y. Okay. You have to be very careful. Now, it depends on your book. I cannot recall what this book does, but you'll find out when you get to WebAssign. Okay. Because some books, depending on the author, it's a big mathematical debate. Okay. Some people think one thing and some people think another thing. So it just depends on which book you're using on which one they're gonna accept in your homework, okay? Some people believe that the y-intercept is a value. And so in that case, it would just be a number and that's it. So you would tell me the, the y-intercept is seven and that's all, okay? But other books believe that the y-intercept is a point. And if you believe that the y-intercept is a point, then you should be giving your answer as zero comma, whatever that y-value is, okay? 
So you have to be very careful, pay attention to your web assign. It will, it will literally tell you type any value or it will tell you type any point, okay? And so if it just wants the value, then your y-intercept would just be the value seven. But if it wants you to type it in as a point, then you would have to type the parentheses and then zero comma seven. Okay, so big, big, big difference there. So make sure you are, and I shouldn't be putting this because it looks like a big minus sign. The blank, we don't know what goes in the box, right? It just depends on the problem. Okay, so for just general graphs, because that's great with a line and all, they're pretty easy to calculate. But what happens if I don't give you the equation and I just give you an image, right? You still should be able to identify the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. Now, if it doesn't land on an actual like two, right? And it lands in between like that other one did, they're probably gonna take guesses if that's what they ask you to do. Otherwise, it'll land exactly on two and that's what they want, okay? So for all of these, it's just for you to identify your intercepts. So if you notice this graph here does not touch the x-axis ever, right? It's This is the lowest value here, and then it's going up on both ends, isn't it? So it'll never touch this, this x-axis, which is why this thing has no x-intercepts ever at all. But if you look at it, it does touch the y-axis one time right there, okay? And so that's the one y-intercept. This one, notice it has three dots on the x-axis. So it has three x-intercepts. And that x-intercept right there, if it's in the origin, it's right there in the center. It actually acts as an x-intercept and a y-intercept, right? So now you've got one y as well. But one of these is the same thing, okay? So you have two points that are just x-intercepts, and then you have one point that's an x-intercept and a y-intercept. Why? Because it looks like that, right? So it fits the description of a y-intercept and it fits the description of an x-intercept, right? Now here, same thing, we only have one x-intercept this case, but two y-intercepts. And then this guy does not touch the x-axis and does not touch the y-axis, so it has no x-intercept, okay? And so, oh, look, see, it does want you to tell me right here. It says the x-intercept, well, it says can be. <laughs> I don't know if that's gonna mean that that's how they want you to write them, but they can be written as some number with a zero, and then the y-intercepts would be zero and then some number, okay? Dun, dun, dun. Some texts denote the x-intercept as that, and then some, Yes, this, they're, they're trying to say what I said, but this does not do it for me. It doesn't say exactly what I said. <laughs> I don't like the language here, but it's essentially trying to tell you that thing that I just talked about, where sometimes they'll refer to the intercept as just the value, but then other times they'll refer to the intercepts as the actual point, right? And so it doesn't matter, they're interchangeable. Just pay attention to web assign when you have to type in your answers, okay? That's the big thing, is whatever it says to type in, that's what you type in, okay? And I'll go look too before we leave to see what it wants. Um, example two says identifying the X and Y intercepts. This is not too bad because they give you the image and they give you the equation. So it says identify the X and Y intercepts of the graph and they give you the equation and they give you the image. So these you can tell, because don't they land right on the values, right? There's no like in-betweens. So we don't have to worry about like guessing fractions or decimals or anything. So this one is which kind of intercept? That point right there. Which kind of intercept is this one? Mm -hmm, it's touching the y-axis, right? So that's a y-intercept. And what are the coordinates of that y-intercept? Mm -hmm, you got it, zero and one. And then this one is touching which axis? The x, 
So this one's the x-intercept. And then what are the coordinates of that one? Negative one and zero. You got it. Okay. Now, could I have done that without the picture? You can. Okay. So if I did not have the image, let's say I only had this equation and that's it, no graph. You can still do it. If I want to know the y-intercept, all I'm going to do is plug in zero for x and figure out what this y should be. So I take that equation. I plug in zero for X, I end up with zero, and then I end up with negative one in the end, right? And so then that tells me my Y intercept is zero and one. The easier one. The other one's harder, but not impossible. So now if I wanna do the X intercept, I have to remember that I need to find the X when the y is zero. So now I'm putting the zero in for the y value. And that leaves me with this equation. And it's not about computing here, it's about solving, right? So I have the minus one. Now that's gone. And how do you get rid of a cube? We haven't talked about that, but does anybody know intuitively how you get rid of a cube? How did we get rid of a square? We took the square root, right? So if I want to get rid of a cube, I need to take the cube root, okay? Which looks like this, a little three, and then a negative one, a little three, and then the x cubed. And then we already know that just like with the squares, if it's a square root and a square, they cancel each other out, right? Well, if it's a cube root and a cube, they also cancel each other out. And so you'll just lay left with X on that left-hand side. And then on the left side, you can do that in your calculator. So I just broke my calculator, but I want to point out to you that the buttons are the same that I'm gonna use on this calculator. So you'll notice that well, it looks a little bit different. We both have an X squared button, right? And above the X squared button is the square root button, right? But your next button, it's a power button just like mine, but my power button looks different from your power button, okay? And above that is the any kind of root button. That's what those represent. So here it has an X and then a root, so who knows what's gonna go in there? And here it has a blank and then the root, who knows what's gonna go in there, right? For this calculator, the one that I suggested that you get, I'm gonna get a replacement today. I just broke it right now when <laughs> the office is closed. <laughs> but tomorrow I'll have another one. Um, but normally what you're going to do is you're going to type in the three. So you would type in the three and then you would hit the blue second and then this button here. For me, I'm going to hit the second and then I'm going to hit that button. And notice it pops it the three and makes it tiny. And it puts it right there in the little index. Okay. This calculator would do the same except it is not working for me. So you don't see anything on my screen. Okay. Um, but over here, you do. Okay, so let me zoom out so you can see me do that again. It's the same button, it's just that this one looks a little different, but does the exact same thing as this calculator. Okay, so you're going to go three, and then notice it's a regular three until I hit that special root, and then it makes it tiny. Okay, and then I can just type in negative one, and it will tell me the answer it's negative one. Why? Because negative one times negative one times negative one. Three of them is a negative one, right? If you know your roots, fantastic. If not, you can use a calculator, right? I know that negative one, the cube root of negative one is negative one, but not everyone does. So at least you can use your calculator. And especially if the numbers get bigger, you have that. Okay. So whether they give us an equation or whether they give us a graph, we should be able to identify intercepts, okay? Another cool thing that they notice is that some images, not all, but some of the images have what's called symmetry, meaning that there's like an invisible line somewhere and the graph looks like a mirror image of itself over that invisible line, okay? And so you have different kinds of symmetry. We will get into those in a little bit. Um, but for right now, they're just letting you know that it exists. Your graphs can look like mirror images of themselves. 
So for instance, this graph here, it says um, this one has symmetry with respect to the x-axis because if you folded the graph along the x-axis, the top part would look exactly like the bottom part, right? If I were to take this graph and fold it right there on the line, the bottom part would mirror right over the top part, right? These two pieces are mirror images of each other, okay? And if you fold it, it folds onto itself. That's all that that's saying. That is what it's called when you have x-axis symmetry. When from top to bottom, your mirror is the x-axis, got it? So the mirror is the x-axis and the reflections are over that x-axis. That's called x-axis symmetry. You also have y-axis symmetry where the mirror is now the y-axis. And so then it looks like a mirror image of itself on the left and the right, okay? And the one that's weird for you to get used to <laughs> is symmetry with respect to the origin. Essentially what you're gonna do for this one is you're gonna fold over twice. You're gonna fold over the x-axis and the y-axis and then it will land on itself, okay? So what I do is I like to mirror it over one of those and then mirror it over the other and you'll notice it lands on top of the other piece. So what I do is I take one of the quadrants like this one and I'm gonna mirror it over the y-axis. When I do that, it's gonna have a point over here and it's gonna go like this, right? Something like that, I'm not the best drawer. But it'll look something like that if I mirror over the y-axis, right? But then after that, if I mirror over the x-axis, my pink image here is going to look exactly like this image in the third quadrant, right? That's symmetry with respect to the origin. So you flip over once temporarily, and then you flip over the other way, and it'll land there, okay? Now, does it matter whether you go over the y-axis first and then the x-axis? It doesn't. Because if I would have gone and flipped this over the x-axis first, this point would have come down here and the graph would have looked like this, right? If I mirror that downward, then I take this green image and I mirror it over the y-axis. So now this curve is gonna mirror over into that curve. And still I landed on the third quadrant, right? So that's what they mean by, um, I'm gonna have to erase this. <laughs> because that is not part of the graph. Those are just there to help me show you the symmetry, okay? But that is called symmetry over the origin. It's essentially both. You can't do one. Notice that when I did one, I was left with pink stuff over here and that's not the graph, right? And when I did it over the x-axis, I was left with pink stuff over here. I mean, green stuff, and that was not part of the graph, okay? So you have to do both for origin symmetry. Now there are tests, okay? In your image, I know they like to put everything in mathematical words, but I'm visual, so I like to make this obvious, I'm visual. So if you have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, basically what it's saying is that, that you have an x-coordinate here and you have a y-coordinate there. If this graph was symmetric with respect to the x-axis, you would also have the same point over here. Okay, this being the negative y value. So if this point is on your graph, then this point should also be on your graph, okay? Because it mirrors over the x-axis, right? Now, when you have symmetry with respect to the y-axis, you have an x value here and a y value there, and that's the point x, y, but you're mirroring over the y-axis, then that means there should be another point over here, right? And that would be the negative value of whatever that was. And so then that's the point negative x comma y that they're referring to. And then for the last one, if you flip it over twice, right? So your point x, y is here, but for the origin, you have to flip it over the x temporarily. So I'll put a light little dot there. And then you have to flip over the y axis and then you have to flip over the x axis. So now I have a point here. Well, guess what? That's a negative x value, and this is a negative y value, isn't it? And so that's why you end up with these coordinates, negative x, negative y, okay? They're trying to tell you in words <laughs> what's happening in the pictures, okay? So 
So let's go look at this problem here. It says that if you have the graph of y equals x squared, um, you can see that it's symmetric with respect to the y axis because um, for every point that you have x, y, you're gonna have negative x comma y as well. And so what they've done is normally you have zero here in the center, but if I did, I would have the point zero and negative two, okay, which is this point right here that they never talk about. But normally, if I were creating a table, like I told you, I like it even, right? Zero in the center, positives and negatives, the same amount, okay? So normally in my table, first of all, I don't write my tables like that. I write my tables like this. So for me, I would have done this. I told you that's my default, right? And when you plug in all of these values into this equation and you calculate, you're going to end up with these values here. Um, negative two, four, so that's two. Which is the same thing they have, I just didn't do three and negative three, okay? So once you plot all of these points, negative two and two, negative one and negative one, zero and negative two, uh, positive one and negative one, and then positive two and positive two. Essentially, I would not have those points, but I would still have this image, right? I'd have three, three, these five dots, and then I'd connect them with the line, right? And with that, you will notice that this is the mirror, right? If you look at that image, it's mirroring itself over my pink line, which happens to be the y-axis. So in this particular graph, it is symmetric with respect to the y-axis because of the way it looks. It mirrors itself over that y-axis, okay? I don't think we do too much with symmetry in this section, but <laughs> I have to talk about it because later if I even say the word symmetry, you need to know what I'm talking about, right? We definitely have to describe everything. So there is a way to test the symmetry um, I can tell by looking at the image because you can see how it's mirroring itself, right? But how would you be able to tell if I've given you an equation? How can you look at an equation and just say, oh, that's got symmetry, you know what I mean? How do you know? Now I'm gonna use one of the examples they just gave me. So this one has symmetry with respect to the y-axis. We just established that, that that has symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So I know it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis. I know that, but I'm gonna show you how to figure it out. Then there was another one that was symmetric with respect to the x-axis. Which one was it? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, that was the y-axis. What is symmetric? Oh, I know one, this one. That one actually has a whole bunch of symmetries, but we'll talk about it in a second. And then you have this one. Um, so you have like three of them. I'll try three of them, okay? So this is how you test. It says, when you replace y with a negative y and you result in an equivalent equation, that is when you know you have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. So they're backwards, notice that. If I'm testing for symmetry with the x-axis, I'm replacing the y's with negative y's. Why? Because this is my x-axis, right? This is my x-axis. And if I'm symmetric over that, I should have a point here and a point there, correct? So that's what we're just verifying. Now I can do that with this one. If I take this equation and I replace y with a negative y, I end up with this, right? Then if I get that y all by itself so that I can compare it to the other original equation, I get positive y, positive 3x, and negative 7. Are these equivalent? How 
I see a few people shaking their head yes, but it's actually not. One of them has a negative 3x, the other one has a positive 3x. One of them has a positive 7, the other one has a negative 7. Those are not the same, right? They might have the same numbers, but they're not the same sign, okay? So these are not equivalent, which means that this equation is not symmetric with respect to the x-axis because that's the one I was testing. Let's go look at the other one. I don't think any of these are, but we're gonna check. Let's look at this one. If I take the y and I replace it with negative y, not to say that it doesn't happen, it does. I just don't think it's gonna happen for any of these particular problems. I want to see if this is equivalent to this. So in order for me to do that, I have to get the y by itself so that this equation will look something like that. So I'm gonna divide by negative one, but then I get negative x cubed minus one. And that is not the same as the original. So this one is not symmetric with respect to the x axis. Now the last one, replace y with negative y, and then divide by the negative one. Dun, 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 I get negative x squared and a positive two. Again, not exactly equivalent to the original, okay? So this one is also not symmetric with respect to the x axis. So I've done the same test for all three, right? But now we need to move on to the second test. The second test is to test for symmetry with the y-axis. Now I know this one's gonna have it because it said it in the previous page, right? So we kind of know that this one's gonna work out, but let's see if it'll work out for those as well. Let's see what happens when it does work out since we know this one is going to. So I'm gonna test symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So that's opposite. That means now I replace the x's with a negative x, okay? So I'm gonna take this equation and I'm gonna replace the x with a negative x. What happens when you do negative x squared? Mm -hmm. It becomes positive x squared. A negative times a negative is positive, right? Now, is this equivalent to the original? It is exactly, right? X squared positive and two negative, positive. okay? So then this one does have symmetry with respect to the y-axis, as we knew it should. But now we can see why algebraically, not just in the graph, okay? So you're gonna hear those words a lot. There's a lot of different, um, there's graphical approaches where you see the image, there's, algebra approaches where you manipulate the equations. And then there's even analytical where you're just basically applying logic and then trying to decipher out what's going on, okay? So there's three different kinds of approaches you'll see in mathematics, okay? Right now we're doing the algebra approach. We already did the visual, the graphical approach, okay? Now for this middle one, if I wanna test symmetry with respect to the y-axis, I am going to replace my x with a negative x. What happens when you do negative x times itself three times? What do you end up with? Negative x cubed. Because you've got an odd number of negatives, right? So you will be left with the negative. But is that equivalent to the original? No. This guy's the bad guy, right? This is what makes it not equivalent. Because here he's negative and up there he's positive, okay? So this one does not have symmetry, or you can say no symmetry. No symmetry with respect to the x axis. Nope, that's not the one I was testing. Which one was I testing? If I plugged in negative x, which axis was I testing? The y axis, right? They're backwards. 
So if I'm doing x with negative x, I'm testing for the y axis. Okay. Now let's try that one. This is the original up here. So now I'm going to replace the x with the negative x. And then a negative 3 times a negative x is going to give me a positive 3x. Is that equivalent to the original? No. The 3x is positive here and it's negative there. So this one also has no symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Now the origin. We already know that the origin was a double whammy, right? We talked about how it looks graphically. You have to reflect it over one axis first and then reflect it over the other axis, which is why when you're doing it algebraically, you have to replace both the x's and the y's with the negatives. So what does that look like? That means that for this one, I would have to plug in a negative y for y, and I would have to plug in a negative x for x. You do both of them at the same time. And for right now, I'm just going to multiply that out. I get a positive 3x. But in order for me to compare this to the original, I have to have the y all alone. So then I get y equals negative 3x minus 7. Is this, now that the y is all alone and the left side, the right side is all simplified, is that equivalent to the original? No. The negative 3x is matched, right? But the 7's got the wrong signs. So this one's got no origin symmetry. And there are problems that will ask you to test all three. Okay, so one problem, and you have to do all three of these tests. Okay. Same thing for this problem here. I'm going to replace the y with the negative y and the x with the negative x. Also pay attention to my notation. Every time I plug in a negative x, I always put it in parentheses, don't I? Okay. The y's I don't because it's just one guy on the left all by himself, right? But if the problem were like this, I would have to put negative x in parentheses here and a negative y in parentheses there, okay? If I were testing symmetry, okay? So just be careful. Here, what is, that should be a negative x cubed, but then if I divide by negative one, I get x cubed minus one. Is that a equivalent to the original? Here's the original. No. The one is throwing it all off, right? So this one has no origin symmetry. And then finally, the last one, I don't think this one does either, but let's look at it. So negative y and negative x, this would become positive x squared. If I divide by my negative ones, I get y equals negative x squared and a positive two. And that was just all completely different signs, isn't it? So this one has no origin symmetry either. Okay, but you won't know. And there are equations that do have x, but not y and not the origin. There's some that have all three. There's some that have just two of the three. There's all different kinds of combinations. Yeah. You truly do have to like that algebraically. I mean, you'll get real lucky if you guess it correctly. <laughs> um, but you definitely have to check all three. Okay. So finally, we can get to the good stuff, <laughs> the circle. Um, so for a circle, essentially what you're doing is you're basically, um, what we call is the standard form of an equation comes from the distance formula literally comes from the distance from that. Because if you have the center here, you know what those coordinates are. You can pick any other point on that circle, any other point. And if you calculate the distance between the center and any point on this circle, right? Doesn't matter where it is. You will be able to use a distance formula to calculate that distance. And that distance geometrically is the radius, right? So we can calculate that radius. And it does not matter where this point is. It could have been way up here. It could have been down here. It doesn't matter. So what they do is they use a general point like x, y, meaning any point on the circle. 
And then they use a specific point, which is the center HK. And if you plug those into the distance formula and you replace the D with R, because that's the radius of the circle, you end up with this equation here. And then they're telling you that if you just square both sides of that equation, you actually end up with this. Where the square root's gone on the left side, and now you have r squared on the right side. And that is the standard form of an equation. And if you have the center and you have the radius, you can plug in this value, this value, and this value. And that's all you need to quote unquote write an equation. Okay. So if you're writing an equation of a circle, you need to know what h is, you need to know what k is, and you need to know what r is. Is the only three. You might have to do some manipulation to find out what H and K is or to find out what R is. But essentially, that is the formula. The X and Y need to stay X and Y when you're writing an equation. Okay, Your equation should always have X and Y in it. So for this page, it just says, you know, here it is. The center is going to be where that H comes from and where that K comes from. And then R is the radius. So that's where the R squared is going to come from. Now it does say, notice that if the circle is centered at the origin, then that would mean that the center is the coordinate zero, zero, right? Because that's the origin. Um, and if you were to put zero here and zero there, essentially all you end up with is X that's being squared and Y that's being squared, right? And you still have R squared. So this is important later when we get into, well, we're not gonna get into it, but the pre-cal class gets into circles centered at the origin a lot. So they'll, they'll use this a whole lot in pre-cal. I'm assuming most of y'all are probably going to take pre-cal, right? Because that's why you rolled with this class and not the other one. The other one's so much easier. <laughs> this one's way harder, college algebra, than the other one. But you need it because otherwise you're gonna be missing a whole bunch of information when you get to the pre-cal if you didn't take this version of the college algebra. Okay, so here we go. I told you this was it. This is the big money. We're gonna to go to example three, example four, and then we're gonna do a couple practices and we're done, okay? So I know a lot of the beginning was probably stuff you already knew. Maybe you learned something about symmetry, maybe not, maybe you already knew it, but I have to make sure we're all on the same page, okay? So I know a lot of you have fallen asleep on me and I apologize. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I gotta go through it. It's also super early. <laughs> exactly. But if you want, do you want me to just jump into it? Do you want to take a five minute break real quick? What do y'all want to do? We'll take a break, anybody needs to go to the bathroom, some water, something? Just want to jump into it? Okay, let's go. <laughs> okay, so for this example, it's always going to say writing an equation. So remember, you have to have X and Y in your equation. Don't make the X and the Y disappear. They need to be there, okay? So when I write out my equation, this thing here, I always like to make this one like super bold for myself, just so that I remember that that guy is not going anywhere, okay? I should not be putting anything in there. It should stay an X and a Y. That's just how I indicate to myself, like don't touch those guys, leave them alone, okay? So it says you have the point three, four, which lies on the circle. And then it has, the circle has a center of one, negative one, two. So typically they don't give you this, okay? But I will draw this if they don't give it to me. Okay, this problem is a little bit easier because they did give us a visual, okay? But if I were to read that, I would literally draw my x, y coordinate system. I would plot the point negative one, two, and then label that my center. And so that's what they've done here, negative one, two. And then I would have just said, this is my center, okay? And then I'm supposed to have another point, three, four, that lies on the circle. So I would go out three, go up four, and then this is just the point on the circle. And that would help circle, can't spell. Why ain't major the math and not English? Okay, there we go. So 
from there, I would imagine like, okay, this is gonna be my radius, right? And then I would draw a circle. I would try to draw a circle. But I would try to draw a circle so that it's evenly spaced around that center, okay? That's not gonna come out perfect unless you have one of the little fancy compass things that revolve around. You know what I'm talking about, the old school ones? Yeah, the protractor, there you go. Um, where you would stick the little point there and then drag the circle around. That's the only way you're gonna get a perfect circle. <laughs> Other than that, it's just gonna look like a hot mess, but that's okay. You just need to have a visual, okay? Once you have this visual, then it's a matter of plugging in everybody where they belong. So I already know the center. So I know that this is H and that this is K from my center because that's what HK is. It's the coordinates of the center. So I already know that in my equation, I'm gonna have this X that's not gonna change. And then I'm gonna have minus my H value, which is a negative one. So I have to have the minus from the formula, but my H is also got a minus, doesn't it? And you can put the parentheses formally, you should, but if you just put negative, negative back to back, as long as you don't you know, make it messy and you don't see it, um, then it's fine to just write it like X minus negative one. That's totally okay. I don't have a problem with that if I see it on your paper. That's not formal, but it's totally okay. Because your next line is gonna look the same as mine anyway. Isn't it gonna look like that? Right, the double negatives. So it don't matter whether you put the extra parentheses in there or not. Now the Y, it says minus, but the K value here is just a two. So I'm just gonna put a two. I'm trying to squeeze in the little R squared. Doesn't look like I did a good job, but I tried. But the R squared should be over there still because I don't know what R is doing. Mm -mm. So I've almost got it. I can clean this up and I can put those double signs together and just write X plus one squared but this one's gonna stay y minus two squared. And the only thing I need now to finish my answer is to know what the heck r is. As soon as I know what r is, I have written the equation that they asked me to write. Remember, all you have to have is h, k, and r to write the equation. Now r, they did not give it to me. I have to go find it. How do we find r? Anybody have any ideas? No ideas? It is a distance formula, you got it. So if I find the distance formula, um, that's going to give me the radius, okay? So let's use those two points that they gave us. Now I have to label them. I'm actually gonna do this in a different color so that my labels make sense for this new computation, uh, computation. So I know that the distance between those points will equal the radius. And then let me label these. So I'm gonna label this one x1, y1, and I'm gonna label this one x2, y2. And I did them in a different color because I already labeled them pink for the equation, right? The h and the k. So now I'm labeling that same point, but different labels. So I'm gonna do my distance formula, which was um, x2, which is negative one, minus x1 squared, plus y2, which is two, minus y1, which is four squared. And then let's see what we get for those computations. So for here, I get negative four. For here, I get negative two. And then here I will get 16 and four, which means I get 20 under there. And if I type that in my calculator, the calculator does tell me this is two square root of five. So this is the actual radius. And if for some reason WebAssign specifically tells you to tell them the radius or it asks you to tell them what the center is, then you have to type in two square root of five, okay? But if all they're asking you for is the equation, it's not gonna look like that in the equation, okay? I'll show you why. When I plug this into the equation, and we'll put that in there. 
it's going to be x plus 1 squared, y minus 2 squared, and then it's going to be 2 squared of 5 squared. No, I wasn't going to be able to squish that in there. Let's try again. It should be 2 squared of 5 squared. But normally, you don't need your equations like this. Whenever you have a number squared, they always usually just like you to square it if it's a number. If it's a variable in there, we know you can't square it, right? So you would leave this one like this, but you would actually square that. And that you can do in your calculator. Parentheses 2 square root of 5, get out of the house, close the parentheses and hit the square button and it should be 20. How do I know that? Because this is equivalent to square root of 20, right? What happens when you square the square root of 20? The house just pops off, right? And so that's how I knew I was gonna get 20. So make sure you actually figure out what R is and then plug it in, but be sure to square. Okay, and this is the final answer. This is all they want. Notice that it said write it in standard form. So once I have it like that, I'm done. That is standard form. There is another form for circles, and I don't know if they're going to talk about it. Nope, not yet. We haven't gotten there yet. They can get real complicated, but they haven't gotten there yet. So it's okay. Okay, so this problem here, oh, this is doing what I did. I forget that these things are already written out. <laughs> so it's the same thing we did. They plugged in the coordinates, they figured out the radius, then they plugged it in. They didn't simplify their square root of 20 like I did, but I did it for a reason. Because sometimes web assign asks you, what is the center? What is the radius? And then what is the equation? And so at least you know what to put in each of those spots, okay? For the center, you put in the point. For the radius, you put in that two square root of five. And then for the equation, it would be this whole thing. So that's one kind where they give you the two points and that's it. They give you the center and then they give you an extra point. Sometimes it happens that they don't give you the center, that they just give you two points. Or sometimes it happens where they just give you the radius and the center. Those are easy. So I want to do the other two kinds of problems. So the first one is the easiest of them. It says write the equation in the standard form, which is this guy. That's the standard form. And remember, I only need to figure out what H, K, and R are. Right, R, R. We know that H, K is the center. And we know that R is the radius. Those are the two bits of information that I have to have in order to give them the equation. And lo and behold, that's exactly what they gave us. Isn't it? They told me the center is negative four, three, and the radius is square root of 19. So I don't have to compute anything. All I have to do is plug in what I have in the right spot and maybe make it look pretty. And that's it. Okay. So I'm going to have x minus what is the h? Mm -hmm. So I have negative four. And then y minus. What is the K? Three. And then what is R? Square root of 19. Now I could have not put those parentheses around the square root of 19. It really wouldn't have made a difference. It truly doesn't. Right? So right like that. What's gonna happen? Mm-hmm. And over here, this one you cannot simplify. 
it just stays one minus three squared. This one you can simplify. What does it turn into? X plus four squared. Okay. And that's it. That's all I needed to do for that one. So that one was the easiest of the three examples. The first one was actually harder. The one they gave us as an example was actually harder than this one, right? Because we had to do that distance. They didn't give us the radius, so we had to go find it. Now we have another one, and this one's even harder. <laughs> Not that those are like so super difficult, but <laughs> this one is more difficult than those two. Okay, in this one, what's going on is that you are given endpoints. You're never given the center. This is the first problem we're given where we are not given the center at all. That makes it a lot harder when you're not given the center, okay? So if I'm not given the center, I'm gonna have to go figure it out. And I'm not even given the radius, am I? I'm just given two points outside the circle. So what I do is I like to visually graph these things. So I would do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, so that point's about there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this point's about over here. And essentially what's happening is that it's creating, again, I cannot draw, but I'm trying. There. <laughs> it might not come out nice whenever I do figure out what that center is. It may not line up perfectly because again, I'm just trying to draw it right. Um, but the center makes sense that if this is the diameter, the center is probably going to be somewhere around here, right? Okay. So we kind of have an idea of where it kind of should be, but we'll see with the competition where exactly where it is. Okay. Okay. I do need two bits of information in this, this formula over here. I need the H, the K, and the R. And this sucks because I have none of them. Right? I don't know the center and I don't know the radius. T.6 is coming in handy now. Because if I do want to know what the center is, geometrically, what is that? If I put my pencil right there, that's the center. What is that with respect to the other two points? It's the midpoint between those two points. And we have a formula for the midpoint. Okay? So my center is going to equal the midpoint between those two points. So I'm gonna use my formula and I'm gonna write it down because we may not remember it. Just to jog back our memories. So then I'm gonna label these guys. I'm gonna call this one X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And then I'm just gonna plug in these values. So I get four plus a negative eight over two. And for the Ys, I get three plus a negative seven over two. Me personally, I don't like to have double signs, so I will multiply those signs together and it's just gonna be a minus eight. Same thing here, we'll multiply these signs together and it's just gonna be three minus seven. So I get negative four over two and negative four over two. How convenient. Now, see, my graph is a little off. <laughs> I almost had a perfect graph where it landed right there. But if I do that right and I draw it, it should be negative two and two, but right here. A little bit lower. So I guess if I would have drawn this line correctly, I would have ended up in between that point two, two. Negative two, negative two, sorry. So that's my center, right? This is my center. Then that also means that this is my H and this is my K. And that's 
two thirds of the information I need, right? I just need to know what H, K, and R are. <laughs> so how do I figure out what R is? There's two ways, actually three ways to find R. Does anybody know one way to find R? We found a previous R. How do we find the previous R? Mm -hmm. Let me take the distance coordinate. So you definitely can do distance coordinate, but there's three different ones you can do. Okay. I could do the diameter and do the distance formula from this spot to that spot, right? But if I found that diameter, how would I find the radius? You have to cut it in half, exactly, okay? So we could do it that way. Since I know these coordinates, the other two ways you could do it is to just find the distance between the center and one other point or between the center and the other point. Those are the three different ways you can find that radius, okay? I can find the distance from here to here, right? Which gives me the radius of the circle. I could find the distance between here and here, which also gives me the radius of the circle. Or I could find the distance between the ends and then just chop it in half, and that would also give me the radius, okay? You don't need to do all three. <laughs> you just need to pick one. Which one do you want to do? The diameter or the center? Pick one of those two. Diameter or the center? You want to use the center? Okay, great. If you want to use the center, do you want to use the point negative eight, negative seven in the center? Or do you want to use the point four, three in the center? Four, three in the center. Got it. So we're going to find the distance between four, three, and that center, which was negative two, negative two. This will give me my radius. That is doing this one here, not this one over there, right? So we are computing this distance right here, okay? So let's go do that, square root, Let's go ahead and minus the x values. So I'm gonna do negative two minus four, plus sign in the middle, negative two minus three. So we get negative six squared and negative five squared. That's 50, 61. Which does not simplify. I don't think it does. Square root of 61. Nope, it stays square root of 61. But we know the R now. So we have enough information to write this equation. It's going to be x minus what? I'm using this equation up here. Mm-hmm, h, right, which is negative two, good, squared plus y minus what? The k is negative two, good. And then what goes on this side? Almost, square root of 61. In the, in the end, yes, it will just be 61, right? Because the square in the house are gone. And then these, they do have double signs, so just clean them up and then you're done. That's the hardest one out of all of them. Is when they don't give you the center or the radius. So you have to use both of those formulas that we learned in P points. Okay. That is the answer there. Let me see this.